Greetings and salutations friends and welcome to yet another Warhammer 40k Lord uh, video. We're going to have something a little special today for uh, 40,000 subs, namely a 30k lore video based around the pre-Horus Heresy period. So, I have been struggling with the question of how to deal with the Horus Heresy law for a while now, whether I should wait for all the books and all the info, despite the fact that we won't have all of the books for something like another seven fucking years, or if I should start doing lore on a book per book basis. Honestly, I still don't really have the answer, but for 40,000 subs I had to do something a little bit special, so what better place to start than with a Primark? And not just any Primark, but the hands-down craziest of them all, the Night Haunter, Conrad Curse. So here we go. Little Conrad was, like his brothers, created by the Emperor to lead his Legiones Astartes in the Great Crusade to claim the galaxy as humanity's birthright. These demigod generals were called Primarchs, and while I am going to have to do a proper video on what Primarchs are at some other time, for now all you really need to know is that Primarchs are fucking OP. A Primarch can quite handily take on dozens of fully armed and armoured Astartes in his underwear, and making a Primarch fight a human is comparable to throwing an infant into a pit filled with 666 starving bears and expect said infant to climb its way back up again. So yeah, Primarch op -o. Back to the point, the Emperor created the Primarchs and were growing them inside growth capsules deep inside the Emperor's laboratories on Terra. However, the Chaos Gods had other plans, incredibly complex and multi-layered plans, that managed to sabotage the facility in which the Primarchs were being grown. This sabotage caused these soon-to-be demigods to be scattered across the galaxy by foul or warp magic. Little Conrad, still sealed within his growth capsule, was deposited rather violently onto the planet Nostramo. Actually, it would be somewhat more accurate to say that he passed through much of Nostramo as his gestation capsule crashed straight through one of the planet's largest hive cities and buried itself deep beneath the planet's crust. It would be quite a stretch to suggest that any of the Primarchs arrived at their new homes with anything resembling subtlety, but Conrad's arrival was particularly brutal as it bore a far closer resemblance to an orbital bombardment rather than a landing. As you can probably imagine, the locals considered this a somewhat ill omen, as they hadn't the faintest fucking idea what had happened and no one was particularly interested in exploring the massive ass crater left by the pod's passing. They simply decided to fill up the crater and the long ass hole leading down from it, and Pretend like nothing happened, just avoid the area like the plague, cause god only bloody knows what the hell that was, and move on with their lives. And while this probably seemed like the best option at the time for the Nostramans, it did leave Conrad in a bit of a pickle, as he was now buried a considerable distance down inside the planet, and uncomfortably close to its molten core. Normally, an infant would have a hard time digging his way through kilometres of planet to reach the surface, a journey further complicated by Nostramo's vast mineral wealth in the form of massive veins of adamantium ore, which just happens to be the strongest metal known to humanity. Luckily for Conrad, and arguably unluckily for the local population, Conrad was not your standard issue infant, and somehow managed to claw his way up through hundreds of metres of earth and metal to the surface of his new home planet. And speaking of the planet itself, I should tell you a bit about it. Nostramo is a so-called night world due to the planet's atmosphere being clogged with pollution that the light of the world's old and dying star is unable to penetrate. Naturally, this also makes the planet somewhat chilly and the population that remains is all based around the equator in five primary hive cities. Said population consisted of fairly normal humans, with some minor mutations brought about by their habitat. For example, Nostramans do not have irises in their eyes, and albino humans are quite common. 
Additionally, the locals suffer from a wide variety of bone-related diseases due to their lack of vitamin D. Well, the overwhelming majority of the population, I should say, as the governing nobility can afford medical treatments and dietary supplements to counteract such things. But nevertheless, it's nothing that would get the planet cleansed by the Empire for being, you know, mutant or anything. Also, speaking of the nobility, Nostramo was a strict and brutal social hierarchy, with the majority of the population being essentially enslaved and forced to work in Nostramo's extensive adamantium mining operations. Mining operations that are, of course, owned by the nobility. And as usual, when a rather small percentage of the population owns virtually all of the stuff, those at the top swiftly begin looking for ways to own more stuff, at the expense of the poor people. This got out of hand pretty darn quickly, and Nostramo soon became a world ruled almost entirely by said nobles, who enforced their rules by various brutal means, which we'll get to in a bit. In reality, the only way for an average worker on Nostramo to get a better life was to turn to a life of crime. Small surprise then that the crime rates kinda shot through the roof until Nostramo could effectively be divided into three classes of people. The workers were the lowest of the low with practically no rights whatsoever, and what rights they did technically have could easily be ignored as the legal system was ever so slightly corrupt. In fact, both the police force and the courts system were usually owned and run by the noble families themselves. Purely out of the goodness of their hearts, of course, and for the betterment of the workers. <laughs> Naturally. And in such a system, the only real way to get ahead is to take whatever you can from whomever you can. And so the second class were the organized criminals. And there is an important distinction to be made there. Virtually every single Nostraman was a criminal in some way, as simply just living through the week would almost certainly involve stealing food at the very least. But the organized gangs had their own social hierarchy. For example, a professional gangster would live far better than a miner, but nowhere near as good as the local kingpin, and said local kingpin would be a mere underling to the local crime lord, etc, etc. All the way up to some gangs that were de facto sponsored by the various noble families with money and privileges in return for various violent services. In fact, many nobles dispensed with the pretense of a police force altogether, and simply used these favoured gangs to enact their own version of uh, law and order. And of course, in addition to these organised gangs, you have all of the independent criminals that live purely by idea that might makes right, and will take anything they can from whoever they can, because they are big and strong, including quite frequently their lives. For example, you might have a person that has gone ever so slightly off the deep end and has decided that he has had enough of being hungry, and so he has started hunting and eating the only prey that exists in abundance in a hive city, namely people. And while there are very few low-class families in Nostramo that can claim with any hint of truth that they have never partaken of some sweet pork at times, when times are particularly tough, these individuals take it a bit further than most, and establish what could probably be referred to as, well, hunting grounds. Sometimes they even establish charming little tribes of pork hunters that fight with the gangers over territory and, well, food supplies. Furthermore, you also have massive quantities of more normal criminals, often consisting of small groups of young boys that have either been thrown out of their homes because their families couldn't afford them, or because their families are simply just dead. It's not a very charming place to live in, in all due honesty. And finally, of course, we have the noble families themselves. Astronomically rich families, in comparison to the workers, these nobles were divided into various houses of varying prestige and power, and spent most of their time oppressing the locals, 
along with competing with each other in less than sportsmanlike ways, assassinations, robberies, arson, etc., was pretty much just day-to-day -day business in Nostramo as the various houses sought to undermine each other in the eyes of their betters, and so try to climb even higher up on the hierarchy of the noble houses. And considering that many of these noble houses essentially had private armies in the forms of these uh, semi-sanctioned gangs, you can imagine that things got pretty damn fucking hot around there. Another wonderful way to climb said social ladder was with extravagant displays of wealth. For example, when a young noble came of age, his house would throw an extravagant party in his honour. Flushing away in mere moments, more money than most common people would see in their entire lives. And you might be wondering why this was allowed to continue. Why didn't the Nostramans revolt against their oppressors and so on? Well, the simple truth is that it was virtually impossible for them to do so. Not because of the massive disparity in weapons and control, etc., although that did, of course, play a bit of a role, but because Nostramans are utterly incapable of organising such a thing. In a society where crime is not just commonplace, but entirely normal, trust is in short supply, and it's pretty damn hard to organise a rebellion, but virtually everyone would be more than willing to sell you out to local law, quote-unquote, enforcement, so they themselves can get enough money to live out the week. Not to mention the simple fact that there's a great many heavily armed gangsters that are making quite the pretty profit of the current state of affairs. In short, Nostramo was an unusually uncomfortable place to live, even by modern 40k standards, as it seemed unlikely to change. But that is, of course, before Conrad Kurse made his rather stylish arrival. In my Hive Cities video, I said that an average underhive is like Gotham City on steroids. Well, Nostramo is a million times worse than that. There is no Commissioner Gordon in Nostramo, and the closest they ever got to Bruce Wayne was the superhuman monster that dug its way up from the planet's own molten core. And in all due honesty, the comparison to the Bat Freak is superficial at best, as Conrad subscribes to a very very different idea of justice. Also, I don't think I've read any Batman origin stories where young Bruce Wayne hunted random people in the streets and ate them after emerging from a self-made hole in the ground, so there is that. As you may well imagine, Conrad was, after all, a wee bit peckish after having dug his way up from the centre of the goddamn Earth. And since there isn't a whole lot of ready-to-eat wildlife wandering around a hive city in a virtually permanent state of near starvation, Conrad simply hunted the game that's most easily available. And as we have already covered, that entails people. However, there happens to be a fair few differences between your average run-of-the-mill cannibal and a genetically engineered god. One of these differences is that a Primarch can absorb some of the memories and feelings of the things he eats. And seeing as Conrad's diet consisted mainly of the poor and the oppressed, he quickly got a fairly decent grasp of the situation. And here's the thing, despite his current diet, Conrad was not an evil man. In fact, he didn't even understand the concept because, well, no one ever taught him, so... While he was able to absorb much of the memories and knowledge of his early victims, concepts such as morality, right and wrong, are much too complex. And even if they weren't, Nostramo has precious little in the way of such concepts. Nevertheless, Conrad wanted to improve things to bring some justice to the world. This urge to be more than just another killer stalking the streets, was probably a part of the Emperor's genetic programming, as all Primarchs did, at least in the beginning, seek to improve things and impose their idea of how things should be onto the worlds they arrived on. Essentially, they always had a bit of a basic understanding that they were something more than the people around them, not just in the sheer fact that they were like three times their size and many, many times their physical capabilities, but that they were somewhat different. Destined for greatness, you might perhaps say. 
However, here's the thing. While other Primarchs ended up in similar societies to Conrad, for example, Korax ended up on a prison planet, scarcely any more hospitable than Nostramo, but Korax met people there that took care of him and taught him about the world and exposed him to more complex ideas, like law, morality, and ideas like freedom and equality. Conrad had no such luck, and while he was certainly superhumanly intelligent, he didn't have any real framework to base his ideas and feelings on, so without these things, he had to build his own opinion of the world and the humans around him from essentially nothing except for what he saw. And as we've already thoroughly discovered, the people of Nostramo were quite rotten to the core, in fact. So it's a small surprise that Conrad's view on them and the world became equally rotten. To further complicate matters, Conrad was a psyker, or to be more precise, he was a precog, but with very little control over his powers. He was unable to peer into the future like the Eldar, and could not gleam specific information about events to come. He could just see snippets of the future here and there, and even then he had little to no way of knowing for sure if what he could see was true or just a lie. In Conrad's own words, his visions were true just often enough that they couldn't be ignored. And while his gifts would uh, become far more honed over the years, possibly not because he was getting a hell of a lot better in precognition, but possibly because he was furthering the very future he saw. But anyways, he had one constantly reoccurring vision. One in which the galaxy was well and truly fucked, but with no real information as to how. Essentially, Conrad knew that this future was a horrible place, but he hadn't the faintest clue how or why it would come to be, or how to stop it. Naturally, Conrad was somewhat hesitant to live in such a shitty place, and seeing as Nostramo was undoubtedly a very very shitty place, he decided to fix it. And this is where things start getting psychotic. Conrad had been observing society for quite some time at this point, all the way from the highest spires down to the lowest slums, and he had come to the conclusion that the people of Nostramo were rotten. All of them were guilty of something, be it murder, thievery, corruption, abuse, violence, etc, etc. They were all guilty to some extent. And so, naturally, it followed that they should all be punished. But despite all this, Conrad still wanted to protect them, he still saw some good in them. And it is important to understand that all Conrad wanted to do at this point was to avoid the horrible future he kept seeing in his nightmares. He wanted to prevent that from becoming a reality, and to do so, he had to fix society, and so he began to correct that very thing that he figured would bring about this future. He began to bring justice. His own version of justice, at least, or to be more precise, the version of justice shared by him and the voices in his head that showed him visions of the future. But here's the thing. Justice is a very complex question. And it is very rarely all black and white. But as we have already gone over, Conrad had no one to explain this to him. To put it more precisely, Conrad simply didn't understand humans. And so, without the nuances that human interaction and relations bring to the concept of justice, Conrad saw the world entirely in black and white. Let me give you a few examples to further illustrate the point. Conrad once saw a man murdering another man for killing his wife. Some would claim that to be justice, as the man was simply avenging a loved one. Some would even go so far as to say it was the right thing to do. All Conrad could see was one man murdering another, and so he flayed the man alive. On another occasion, he saw a woman steal a loaf of bread to feed her family. Again, some would say that is the right thing for her to do. And very few people would argue that the woman be put to death for such a minor crime, especially as it would leave her children without a caregiver. Conrad flung her off a roof while her children watched. 
As far as Conrad was concerned, someone that stole to feed his or her's family was just as guilty as a man who stole purely for selfish reasons, and so punishing them was equally just. The problem was that he could kill a thief, but people kept stealing. He could kill a murderer, and yet people still committed murders. And while there were most certainly people on Nostramo that committed murder and theft simply because they could, or wanted to, there were still more people that committed crimes because they had to, to survive. But again, Conrad didn't understand the difference, and so all he saw was that crime was still being committed. And so he punished the next thief he caught more severely. He killed him slowly, and yet people still committed theft. There was only one thing to do, go catch the next thief and punish him slower. And so on, and so on, until Conrad would simply catch the th thief and imprison him somewhere until he could round up any family or loved ones the thief might have and then flay them in front of him. The more crimes committed, the more innovative and gruesome Conrad's punishments became. Now you might be thinking, how could Conrad possibly justify this to himself? He's been murdering and torturing people for stealing bread. Surely that is just as vile a crime, if not more so. Ergo, Conrad himself is a criminal. Conrad didn't see it that way. Honestly, the thought probably didn't even cross his mind until much, much later, because after all, he was not committing any crimes. He was simply bringing justice. There's a lovely example from one of the Horus Heresy books that illustrate this point. Conrad had caught an old man red-handed committing some crime or another, and was currently in the process of flinging him off a hive spire. Naturally, the man was terrified. At this point, Conrad had been dispensing justice for quite some time, and the old man had absolutely no illusions about whom it was that had captured him, and so, naturally, he was crying his eyes out, begging for mercy. A fairly pointless effort, it's true, but when a Primarch is dangling you by the ankle over a sheer drop, it's about as good an option as any other. And Conrad was, well, confused. Why is he crying? He committed a crime? And so it is only natural that he would be punished. Surely the human must have known this, and if he is so afraid of the consequences, then why did he even commit the crime in the first place? And most confusing of all, why did he appear to be more afraid of Conrad than the ledge he, that he was about to be thrown off? Conrad was justice, an unavoidable consequence, so why would the man be so shocked and scared of such an obvious and inevitable thing? He spent a few moments contemplating this, and then he pitched the old man off the roof. These experiences did, however, provide Conrad with one simple insight into the human mind. They were afraid. A human might be afraid of starving to death, and so the human would commit a crime to eat. But the curious thing was that once Conrad had captured the perpetrator and began to cut him, then quite soon the human would begin to ask for death. Ergo, the human must fear him more than death. So all Conrad would have to do to stop people from committing crimes was to make them fear the consequences of the crime more so than anything else, including death. And if you look at all of this from Conrad's perspective, it's a pretty obvious conclusion. Firstly, all people are criminals, and you can hardly expect criminals to start policing themselves in the name of justice, so he would have to do it for them. Secondly, all people are rotten and care for nothing besides themselves, and so will naturally take advantage of others to further their own goals. As such, the punishment of a few will have no effect, as the vast majority of criminals will only see this as an opportunity to take what their former competitors once owned. Therefore, all criminals must be punished. But since all people are criminals, this would involve killing every man, woman, and child on the planet. And this solution was unacceptable, as it will not improve anyone's lives, because they'll all be dead. With this in mind, we have to return to the idea of punishing a few 
but it must be done in such a way as to discourage the many. So, what discourages people? Loss of property and or wealth is clearly not enough as they burn and steal like it was an Olympic sport, and it hasn't improved anything. On the contrary, it makes people commit more crimes to regain what they have lost. All that remains, then, is death. Regardless of the severity of the crime, the punishment would always be death. Nay, indeed, the crime had to be punished with death. It was necessary. Not because the crime itself necessarily warranted such an extreme sanction, but it, because it was necessary to discourage others. Conrad experimented with just plain old death for a while, but fairly quickly realised that just death was not enough. Death is not a rare to Nostromo, and while it might still discourage some and be scary, it simply isn't scary enough to stop everyone from committing more crimes. Which means you have to make the way you inflict said death as slow and painful as possible while still leaving the corpse easily identifiable to friends, family, and others. Which can be quite a challenge, as humans tend to be somewhat... fragile. Luckily, Conrad was nothing if not imaginative, and quickly came up with a whole host of extremely slow and painful ways of killing people. But now we return to the question of how to discourage people from committing the crimes that they will be punished for. Slowly dismembering someone in an alley over the course of days will be very discouraging indeed for the person being dismembered, but will do precious little to discourage people who know nothing of the man's fate. Simply put, it is not enough for the criminal's death to be horrific. It also has to be public, and it has to be horrific enough to scare the shit out of people for whom death, crime, and even cannibalism are day-to-day -day occurrences. Coming up with torture gruesome and slow enough to shock the average citizen in an Ostraman hive city would be quite the challenge for even the most dedicated of psychopaths. But luckily, Conrad was far, far more than your average garden variety psychopath, and with his superhuman mind he was able to devise several shall we say, awe-inspiring ways of punishing those he considered criminals. For example, he would flay a criminal piece by piece over the course of weeks, all the while decorating the neighbourhood with the flayed bits, making sure to leave any identify marks, such as tattoos or birthmarks, intact. On other occasions, he would broadcast the screams of his victims by tapping into local radio stations. This idea in particular showed promise, and he would go on to refine it over the years until, near the end of his campaign of rehabilitation, he would simply televise his torture sessions and, of course, make it essentially mandatory to watch. But that is a fair bit further into Conrad's future. Lastly, it is not enough to simply scare people with the consequences of other people's actions. The final piece of this twisted puzzle was personal dread, and the sharing of said personal dread. Conrad had to convince every man, woman, and child on the planet that if they did anything wrong, then he would come for them. Simple as that. And he did this both by the methods I've already described, but he added one final touch. Instead of simply just hunting down and catching the perpetrator, and then carrying out the sentence, he would on many occasions run them down. He would be hunting several perpetrators at once, and he would make sure they always knew he was just around the corner, that he was always getting just a little bit closer, constantly pushing them, pressuring them underneath a constant cloak of dread. Just imagine for a moment, trying to escape from someone you could never escape from. Imagine trying to escape from Superman. It is literally an impossible task, and not only that, but the monster hunting you is so good so vastly superior in every way
that he's just toying with you, and this could take weeks. Conrad would simply wait patiently until the victim snapped. He would use dozens of uh, psychic torture methods. For example, he would leave up the pressure for just a little bit, making the man dare to hope and then return even worse. He would let the man think that he had found shelter. For example, a career criminal might flee to his comrades. He might flee into the largest scum of hive and villainy on the planet, thinking himself secure, surrounded by allies. And then Conrad would simply appear in their midst, murder a vast number of them, and then disappear. Simple as that, just disappear. If that was not enough to make the man's former comrades kick him the hell out, he would do it again, and again, and again, until the man's friends, the man's family, turned on him. Until he had nothing left, until he was literally begging for death, and only then would Conrad catch him. And then he would give him death, over the course of weeks if not months, he would surgically keep people alive specifically for this purpose. And then he would often use these tortures, he would use the victims, to scare their families. Like, imagine living in such constant dread that you willingly ousted a family member, knowing full well that a monster would catch and torture him, possibly for weeks, and then being forced to listen to that torture to be sent the body parts of this family member over the course of days and even weeks, months, to have parts of them appear in your house. Conrad took all of this and perfected every last single step of it in a way that only a Primark can do anything. Robert Gilliman wrote a book that covered every single possibility in warfare. That is the level of intelligence we're talking about here. And Conrad bent every last shred of his mind to the art of torture, of dread, be it psychological or physical. Eventually, people got the message and crime rates dropped like a rock. This let Conrad turn his shaggy head towards other less obvious crimes like neglect, corruption, oppression, or abuse of power. Crimes like these are harder to prove than just good old street crime, but then again Conrad never really cared too much for proof anyways. Don't get me wrong, he would usually not just kill people willy-nilly, but his standard of evidence was certainly not on par with more modern courts. Canadian human rights courts, maybe, but certainly not proper courts. To put it more plainly, though, Conrad would punish people for not doing the right thing, rather than doing the wrong thing in these cases. For example, he killed a factory owner with 309 separate cuts, because the man hadn't done enough to prevent a fire in his factory that killed 309 workers. This continued to escalate until Conrad, then known as the Night Haunter, was such a massive boogeyman that people would rather starve to death than steal food. And the rich would spend enormous sums to make sure their workers were safe, and in some cases even marginally happy. And so, with one hive city too scared to even take a piss without asking for permission, Conrad popped over to the next hive and did it all again, minus the soft start he had given the first hive, of course. Now that little Conrad had perfected his particular skill set to a razor's edge, and in some cases, quite literally, the rest of Nostromo's hives quickly fell in line with the first. Eventually, people were so afraid of Conrad that he actually found himself with some free time on his hand which was quite a rarity in between the merging and the dismembering, so he decided it was time to start taking a more active role in the planet's governorship. 
Just so happens that right around that time, the leading nobles of the various hives were all located in roughly the same spot to discuss how to deal with the Night Haunter. A ridiculously heavily defended spot, but nowhere near enough to keep fiction's most horrific version of Batman out, he presented the nobles with an offer they simply couldn't refuse. Crown me king, or I crown myself and decorate my pals with your intestines. Unsurprisingly, most of the nobles were extremely positive to the idea of getting themselves a new overlord, although a few did speak out and I would like to read for you a small part of the conversation that Conrad had with said nobles. By reason, by truth, I have learned how your hearts and minds function. With that lore, I brought peace to this culture. At the cost of freedom, peace reigns as I reign. I wouldn't expect you to understand you are a little man with little dreams. You've ushered in the peace of the graveyard, peace at the cost of surrendering all choice, all freedom. The city lies in terror, forced to live by the standards you placed upon our shoulders. Yes, yes. But every sin is punished, punished by death. No matter the crime, no matter the scale of the sin, the people of the city live in silence, needs a single word earned them death for speaking out against you. Yes. Listen. Listen to the sound of raw silence. Is it not serene? Charming, I'm sure you would agree, and I'm not even going to try to put on a night haunter voice because that would just be ridiculous. And again, with the only options being an extremely drawn-out death or subservience, Conrad was quite quickly made the de facto king of the hive city Nostramo Quintus. And to everyone's surprise, Conrad turned out to be a pretty good ruler. He massively improved people's living standards and made sure every home had a television set. Granted, uh, at least having a television set was in fact mandatory, and not having one was a crime and punishable in Conrad's usual way. And the reason why not having a TV was a crime is that Conrad would televise his punishment of criminals to make sure that people didn't get any ideas. If anything though, Conrad's apparent wisdom and benevolence triggered the population even more than his violent side. Because now, not only were they scared shitless, they were scared shitless and confused. For example, Hum, if I ask our Lord and Saviour Conrad Curse for some food because I'm hungry, will he give me a biscuit or will he murder fuck my boss for not paying me enough to buy food? Generally speaking, the vast majority of the population decided to err on the side of caution and keep their heads so far down they're literally teabagging themselves many going so far as to start giving away their money and possessions so that they could be equal to everyone around them. Just in case Lord Conrad woke up one dark and dreary morning and decided that, that, that having more stuff than your neighbour was a crime. Cause just because little Conrad had become King Conrad didn't mean that he was too busy to go out and personally punish any injustice brought to his attention. And while he caught a lot of criminal activity going on before, simply because he's a goddamn Primarch and can pretty much force the truth out of someone just by staring really hard at them, but after becoming the great lord and saviour, Conrad Curse, he found he now had access to tons of video and audio surveillance options. By the time the Imperium arrived, crime was virtually non-existent, and everyone lived in shared prosperity, a Marxist dream, with the only downside being that they also shared equally in the bowel loosening fear that one of these days the Night Haunter would show up at their doorstep. This slight and potential breach of privacy, however, couldn't really be seen from the outside, and so, to an outside observer, Nostramo appeared a model of the perfect society. 
where everyone was working towards a common goal with absolute devotion. The image cracked a little bit upon closer examination as the people went about their day-to-day -day chores in almost complete silence, at least an unguarded word to see them judged guilty of some form of non-conformity, and the streets at night were entirely empty. No merry-making and no festivities of any kind. Despite all this, though, no one could deny that the new Nostraman system was effective, and they showed no sign of wishing to resist the Imperium, so the Emperor, along with Rogal Dorn, Ferris Manus, Logar Aurelian, and Fulgrim, descended to the planned surface along with a quarter of a million legionaries, and entered Nostramo Quintus on foot, marching all the way through the city to the Night Haunter's palace at its centre, where Conrad was waiting for them. All preparations had already been made, as Conrad had known of the Emperor's coming in his visions of the future, that were becoming clearer to him every single day. More insisting, and sharper. In fact, he had already seen the faiths of the four brothers that had come to meet him, or at the very least he had seen something that he would consider to be their fate. Unfortunately, Conrad's daddy was so unfathomably awesome in his golden radiance that Conrad's attempt to see his future nearly drove him mad, or, well, mad-er, and he tried to claw out his own eyes. The Emperor stopped him, and according to Conrad, the Emperor's touch actually banished the voices and the niggling pain he'd been struggling with for a brief while, which is an interesting thing to note, because the Emperor, being an extremely powerful psyker, wouldn't, in all due likelihood, banish psychic powers. The influence of the warp, however? Hmm... We'll get to that in a little bit, actually, or, well, we'll get to that in a while, because I have some more rambling to do. Anyways, the Emperor spoke to Conrad. Be at peace, Conrad, because I have arrived and I intend to take you home. And Conrad's ominous reply was recorded as well. That is not my name, father. My people gave me a name, and I will bear it until my dying day, and I know full well what you intend for me. Again, this reply is really interesting because he refutes his own name and chooses to take upon himself the more dreadful one, Night Haunter. The one that bears all of the responsibility, all of the blame for his actions, you know, is Night Haunter. And again, we'll get into this later because I think this is a really interesting part of Conrad's psyche, but... Moving on, Conrad, or Night Haunter as he called himself now, submitted himself and his world to the Imperium, without further questions. And the Night Haunter was brought on board the Emperor's ship and placed under the tutelage of his brother Fulgrim. Unsurprisingly, being a Primarch, Conrad quickly learned and mastered the complex workings and doctrines of the Legiones Astartes in the Imperium and was quickly given command over the Eighth Legion, which he named the Night Lords. The Night Lords themselves will have to be a subject of another video, but suffice to say, there is no such thing as coincidence in the Emperor's plans, and the Eighth Legion fit Conrad like a glove. Perhaps a little too well, in fact. And the Night Lords under Conrad Curse quickly established a reputation that cannot accurately be summed up in mere words. Instead, I would like for you to imagine just how horrifying a fighting force would have to be to make entire planetary systems not only surrender, but also pay all outstanding tithes and taxes, as well as find and execute any ringleaders and separatists, just by the mere suggestion that the Night Lords would be sent to deal with them. And for a while, Conrad found some comfort in this. By murdering thousands, he could save billions. He was performing his role just as he knew the Emperor had always meant him to, and while he knew his father could never outright endorse his brutal tactics, the simple fact that he allowed them, and that he had created Conrad and the Night Lords in the first place, was validation enough. And again, Conrad was not at the very least, yet, an evil man. 
He was extremely fair and impartial, to the point of obsession. And if things had turned out differently, perhaps he would have been the post-Crusade Imperium's law keeper, its judge, jury, and if need be, executioner. However, sadly, that future was not to be. As we have already established, Conrad was never the most stable of characters, and he had a tendency to push his idea of justice just a little bit too far, a tendency made all the worse by his ever more frequent bouts of more or less well, insanity. Just, yeah, simple as that, honestly. The voices in his head and the visions they brought became worse and louder. Eventually, it would seem he developed something close to a split personality, though I personally think that this is a bit of an oversimplification, and I'll get to that in a bit. The original 8th Legion, with Conrad in control, could be ever said to have been a necessary monster. Something dark and horrible that could be used to pacify vast numbers of people with an unspecific, yet extremely real threat. For example, the Night Lords would be tasked with bringing down a small human empire of a few dozen worlds. You know, nothing that could withstand the Imperium, but you wouldn't really want to just level the place either. The Night Lords would attack one world, pacify it, and then begin to systematically torture and murder 99% of the planet's population over the course of months, and then dispatch the surviving 1% to the remaining worlds in the Empire to spread the word of their atrocities, while also broadcasting the screams and the pictures of the torture on every single frequency they could get their grubby little claws on. And then, they would wait. Sometimes for months, or even years, while raiding civilian transports or kidnapping civilians, and then sending the brutalized remains back to their families. Almost always, the initial atrocity would be met with cries of fiery vengeance, civilians and officials alike vowing to punish these barbarous invaders and claim justice in the name of the slaughtered innocents. But the Night Lords were nowhere to be found. They simply just avoided them. The only signs that they were still around would be a constant stream of mutilated corpses. Occasionally, the Night Lords would turn upon their would-be pursuers and butcher them in their hundreds simply just to reinforce the message, but for the most part, the Terror did all the work. It was a slow way of conquering systems, but it was a sure way, and the death toll when compared to full planetary invasions carried out by the notoriously brutal Digionis Astartes was minimal. In that respect, it was a very humane way of waging war. A few had to suffer, it is true, but in the long run, Conrad's campaigns of terror saved a lot more people than it actually hurt. And again, it was this preservation of life that was Conrad's ultimate goal. It was, in fact, the goal that justified the means, both to Conrad and his legionaries. The Astartes would perform their terror tactics with skill and efficiency, but they took no pleasure in it. Unfortunately, even Astartes are at a basic level human, and the human mind will do strange things to cope with mental trauma, and having to skin a man alive as his children cry as they watch is a pretty damn good way of acquiring some mental scars. Granted, Astartes are far more resilient to this than normal humans, but eventually the horrific torture became slightly less horrific. Then it became just a tasteless task, but no more. And then it became kinda normal, and eventually it became kinda... fun. The transition from necessary monster to just monsters was slow and subtle, and once it had happened, it was utterly irreversible. Perhaps a terror weapon like the Eighth Legion was necessary to maintain a galactic empire? I can certainly see arguments for why it would be, but such a weapon must be handled with supreme care and discipline. Maybe someone like 
Dawn or Gilliman would have been better suited to this task and could have managed to enforce the discipline required to keep the blade blooded, so to say, but the hilt and sheet clean. Maybe, it's pure speculation, but they were not in command of the Eighth Legion, so it doesn't really matter for much. Conrad was in command, and in all honesty, he probably broke long before his legion did. So let's return to the idea of Conrad's split personality. Conrad curse a night hunter, and why I think that it might be a little too simple of an answer to simply say that he had a split personality. First up, Undeniably, Conrad was plagued by visions of the future and whispers in the night. From what we know from the Horus Heresy, this is likely to have been a manifestation of Conrad's attachment to the warp through his precognitive abilities. We also know that the warp can be a bit manipulative, to say the least, and that the entities inside of it had been planning the heresy for quite some time. It is therefore not entirely unlikely that many of Conrad's visions were cherry-picked and subtly altered in an effort to drive him towards the desired goals of the entities inside of the warp. They needed Conrad to become a monster, simple as that. They needed, in fact, him to become the monster he pretended to be, and so they laid the foundations for this on Nostramo. Manipulating Conrad's biologically programmed need for justice, which he had probably been worked into him by the Emperor to counteract his more savage tendencies that he would have to use in his role as the Emperor's terror weapon, they used this need for justice to push him into punishing the things he thought was wrong. And since he had no deeper understanding of justice or humanity, he ended up taking it to what seemed to him to be the logical conclusion. The maximum amount of justice and fairness for the maximum amount of people, no matter the cost. And honestly, that was all fine and dandy for a while on Nostramo. Nostramo became prosperous and the people were, if not happy, then safe and cared for. No one would ever starve again on Nostramo, not under Night Haunter at the very least, although it must be said that the planet quite quickly deteriorated once he had left. But nevertheless, this clearly justified Conrad's actions, and more importantly, it justified his actions to him. When Conrad first wandered off into the slums of Nostramo to skin himself some hobos, he did so with the complete and utter conviction that it was the right thing to do. In fact, not doing it would be a worse crime than doing it. But after acquiring more and more knowledge, both from Nostramo and the wider Imperium, it must have been pretty tough for Conrad to justify his earlier actions, especially when faced with some of his brothers who had built far grander empires than him without resorting to terror tactics. And on top of that mental burden, we add in a few dozen years of skinning and dismembering people in ever more artistic ways to Conrad's already groaning psyche, and the fact that now he isn't the only one handing out punishment. He's no longer the sole arbiter of what is just. In fact, now he is endorsing the crime that he fought against, as now he is leading an entire army of ever more violent and psychotic killers as they rampage through the galaxy. In fact, on multiple occasions, Conrad pretty much stated straight out that he hated his Night Lords. He considered them to be the worst scum in the galaxy. At one point, he remarked upon the purges that the other traitor Primarchs did within their legions, where they cleaned out the elements of their legions that they thought would not be entirely loyal to them, that perhaps would be more loyal to the Emperor, rather than, for example, to Horus. He remarked upon the fact that they knew exactly where to begin, and they knew exactly where to stop. Conrad wouldn't even know where to begin, and he doubted that if he started, he would ever be able to stop.
And so he didn't. Conrad was literally of the opinion that if he started to punish and to cleanse his own legion the way he had been treating the people of Nostramo, there would be nothing left of it. And what does that say of him? And, and then, of course, you also have Conrad's internal voices getting ever more strident and, by the way, numerous. Eventually, Conrad decided that his personal quarters aboard his flagship needed some freshening up, so he started hanging corpses from the roof, because that way he could change the feng shui of the room and help him keep track of the voices by assigning them to one corpse or another. And here's the problem, as if any more were needed. If you have ever done something truly horrible, something really bad to someone, it can be a hard thing to deal with, because it would naturally make you a worse person. Which is something humans have a hard time doing. I mean, even Hitler probably didn't consider himself a bad guy. So they seek to justify their actions. And Conrad had done a lot of bad things over the years, and was really starting to struggle with justifying his previous actions. And so he did the only thing he could do to try and prop up his sense of self. He would seek to prove for himself that all other people would do the same things that he had did, if put in the same position. I don't want to get into the Horus Heresy lore of books here, because spoilers, but I would like to take an example of this from said series. Namely, Conrad's take on the allegory of the long spoons. If you don't know it, I suggest googling it real quick, but I'll give you the general gist of it. Essentially, a bunch of people are tied to chairs placed around a table, and they have no way of freeing themselves. There is a ton of food on the table, within easy reach of each person seated at the table, and they have utensils strapped to their arms. But these utensils are strapped to them in such a way that they cannot feed themselves. The point of the story is that in heaven, this being a biblical thing originally, people are charitable and nice, and so they feed each other. But in hell, the greedy little bastards starve as they refuse to feed each other. As you can imagine, Conrad was quite triggered by this idea, as it denied his lived experiences, and therefore it was obviously wrong. And so he decided to test it for himself so he could prove that humans are greedy and selfish beings by nature. And so he placed a fair few people around a table, bound them to the chairs, and proceeded to chop off their arms at the elbow, rip out their eyes, and blow out their eardrums. Although, to be fair, he did at least hammer some utensils into the stumps of their arms. So, fair is fair, I suppose. Unsurprisingly, seeing as the people at the table couldn't see or hear anything, the humans didn't feed each other. After all, they had no way of even knowing there were other people in the room. And Conrad took this as proof that all humans were indeed greedy by nature. Now, we don't know exactly how we arrived at this final version of the experiment, but we can speculate. I propose that Conrad tried the experiment out like it was supposed to work, and the humans, not being complete idiots, fed each other. Because, you know, you're starving, the only way for you to get food is to uh, feed other people so they will in turn feed you, you know, it's a fairly simple problem. And so, Conrad would find some way of viewing the experiment in such a way that it was flawed. There was something wrong with the experiment. And so he simply kept modifying the experiment until he found a way to make the experiment, the facts themselves, to fit his conclusion, rather than to make the conclusion fit the facts. This way of conducting quote-unquote scientific experiments have become ever more popular lately in our own society, so I don't find it too much of a stretch to think that someone else that might have done horrible things and now are seeking to justify their existence would do the very same thing. However, we do have a little bit further 
evidence for this theory. And by the way, this is spoilers for the Horus Heresy series, so if you don't want anything of that spoiled, you should probably close the video now, because up until this time, I've just been taking out snippets out of context without a whole lot of information, but this is going to be a fairly large one, so... off you go. Anyways, Conrad captured his brother Primarch Vulcan and forced him to undertake various tests in an attempt to prove to himself and Vulcan that Vulcan was in no way better than Conrad. And by the way, yes, I do know Conrad didn't really capture Vulcan per se, but I don't want to spoil that one, regardless of whether or not you want to be spoiled, so I'm just going to say he was captured. However, he did take several salamander prisoners as well, which I suspect he did for the same reasons. Vulcan, after all, was one of the more noble Primarchs, and his legion was considered to be equally noble, the complete opposite of Conrad Curse's Night Lords, and so, again, he wanted to prove to himself that even Vulcan and his vaunted noble legionaries were actually just bigoted hypocrites. And, well, the problem was that he didn't really succeed, which drove him even more batshit. And finally, he confronted Sanguinius and tried his absolute darndest to make Sanguinius kill him. In fact, he quite literally asked him to kill him. He swore he would not resist, and I, for one, believe him. Because you gotta remember, Conrad could see the future, and at this point, I'm pretty sure that Conrad knew that the future he had already been shown was, at the very least at some basic level, a falsehood. He knew that he had probably been manipulated, and he was looking for a way out. He was looking for the last possible escape. He wanted to try anything to stop that future that he kept seeing, and he was realizing that what was bringing that future to be was him. Unfortunately, Sanguinius refused to kill his brother and told them that even now, even after all Conrad had done, he could come back into the fold, he could be accepted back into the Imperium. Sanguinius even offered to personally protect him from his brothers, and Conrad considered it. In fact, it would appear that he wanted it. He wanted to be the good guy. He had always wanted to be the good guy. And right now, he wanted to be saved. But no matter how much he wanted it, he couldn't justify it to himself. Conrad had come full circle. He had become the monster. He had become the criminal. And it had begun to dawn on him that he could not let himself be saved, because it would invalidate everything he had ever done. Everything he had done, he told himself he had done in the name of justice. If he was to let himself be saved, which he considered to be an utterly unjust act, he would have to come to the realization that everything he had done was very, very wrong indeed. And so he desperately sought for someone to punish him, someone righteous to punish him. He couldn't kill himself because that would be admitting defeat. And he couldn't just ask any of his brothers to do it. He was entirely convinced, you must remember, that Vulcan would do what Conrad had done if he had been placed in his position. He was convinced that Rogar Dawn and uh, Gilliman were just putting on an act, a pretense. They didn't understand the universe like he did, while all the while simultaneously suspecting that he might actually be the one in the wrong. He needed someone truly just. He needed someone he could look up to and respect. And that honestly only left him with one option. Unfortunately for Conrad, that one option was quite literally an angel. Sucks to be Conrad. And while Conrad did eventually find someone to give him the justice he so craved, it was far too late. 
At that point, Conrad Curse was almost entirely gone. He had locked that part of him away deep inside of his psyche underneath the Night Haunter, which he used as his lens to view the world and to protect whatever remained of his humanity. The tale of Conrad Curse is honestly a tragic one. Despite all of the horrible things he did, despite all of the terrible things he would go on to do, I honestly think that Conrad Curse, the Night Haunter, is probably the most human of all the Primarchs. And with that, I will leave you. This has by no means been a complete lore video on Conrad Curse, as I have tried to include as little information of the Horus Heresy series as possible until I can figure out a good way to do it. But I do hope this will have given you a bit of insight into the Night Haunter. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you again soon. Thanks for 40,000 subscribers, and uh, have a good day.